Yo, what's up, Ryan? So, I'm going to get right into reading this. I think it should only take me about an hour and a half to do two chapters of Asada Shakur, an autobiography. We're starting from chapter eight. And of course, there is an ongoing thread of the previous chapters. So I should be done with this fairly quickly. Let me see, let me have it pulled out. All right, so I'm just gonna jump into it. After the village, I lived with Evelyn on 80th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus in Manhattan. She had a garden apartment in a brownstone. Nothing grew in the garden but weeds and it was where our neighbors threw their garbage. The apartment was one big room that we used for sleeping, eating, and living. It had a kitchen and a bathroom with an old fashioned toilet up on a platform and an overhead tank so that you had to pull a little chain to flush it. Evelyn always referred to it as the dump. She had it fixed up nicely, but it was just too small for two people, especially if one of them was me. I was a slob and Evelyn went to great pains to train me in neatness. In a small place like that, when just a few things are out of place, it looks like a hurricane passed through. And many times after a long day's work, poor Evelyn would be greeted with a hurricane, a tornado, and an earthquake at the same time. Gradually, I learned to keep things in something vaguely resembling order. The neighborhood for me was exciting, full of character and different flavors. Central Park and Riverside Park were nearby and I immediately fell in love with both of them. Then also, there were plenty of museums nearby. I spent hour upon hour in the Museum of Natural History and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They were free then and full of fascinating things. There were all kinds of stores for me to explore and examine, even though most of the time I didn't have any money. I was delighted with it all. And it was my first clear glimpse of the hierarchy of American society. 18th Street, like many of the nearby streets, was changing. Most of the changing, however, had taken place before I got there. Most of the Germans had moved out and Blacks and Puerto Ricans were moving in. Evelyn told me that when she moved there, it was so safe. She had slept in the summer with the back door open and just the screen door latched. On 80th Street, there might be three, four, five, or more people huddled in one room apartment. Sometimes the apartments were rented furnished with nothing but an old, I'm sorry, rented furnished with nothing but an old saggy bed, a chest of drawers, and a beat up refrigerator and stove. You could usually tell them from the outside by the paper thin plastic curtains shimmying in the wind. Most of the people on 80th Street were poor, although here and there were a few renovated apartments that catered to a clientele that was a little richer, usually quote unquote night people. 79th Street was directly behind us, but there was a world of difference between the two. It was an upper middle class street. Doctors and lawyers and a lot of performers lived there. Every day after school, I would hear an opera singer practicing. Maybe that's why I developed a profound dislike for opera. The people on 79th Street wouldn't dream of socializing with the people on 80th Street. They recognized our existence with a mixture of amusement, fear, and dislike. 81st Street between Central Park West and Columbus Avenue was even richer. The lobbies were ele elegant and the doormen were splendidly attired. They were, for the most part, all white, and not even slightly aware of the people who lived only a block away. Farther over toward the river, near West End Avenue or Riverside Drive, there was a middle-class neighborhood. The buildings were usually old, grandiose, and well-kept. The people who lived there were mostly white, of course, with a few Blacks and mixed couples thrown in. The Upper West Side, as the neighborhood was called, was supposed to be a quote-unquote liberal stronghold, I have never really understood exactly what a liberal is, though since I have heard liberals express every conceivable opinion on every conceivable subject, 
as far as I can tell. You have the extreme right who are fascist, racist, capitalist dogs like Ronald Reagan, who come right out and let you know where they're coming from. And on the opposite end, you have the left who are supposed to be committed to justice, equality, and human rights. And somewhere between those two points is the liberal. As far as I'm concerned, liberal is the most meaningless word in the dictionary. History has shown me that as long as some white middle-class people can live high on the hog, take vacations to Europe, send their children to private schools and reap the benefits of their white skin privileges, then they are quote unquote liberals. But when times get hard and money gets tight, they pull off that liberal mask and you think you're talking to Adolf Hitler. They feel sorry for the so-called underprivileged just as long as they can maintain their own privileges. Sometimes I walked over to the east side on the other side of Central Park. If Riverside Drive was like another city, then the east side was like another world. English nannies pushed fancy baby carriages, they called them trams, and through the eastern side of Central Park. The only black people you saw were servants, or like me, those just passing through. Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, chauffeur-driven cars, diamonds, and furs, the Upper East Side was for the show enough rich. When I'd walk through those streets, some looked at me as if I was an object from a museum or something. Once or twice, a doorman actually stopped me and asked where I was going, but I kept walking and looking. Sometimes I'd have some fun and walk into one of those stores. I couldn't believe there were people who paid that kind of money for those things. As soon as I stepped in, the salespeople were right on me. Sometimes I said I was just looking. Other times I would ask for outrageous things like pickled feet. Usually they would say, what, what, what? and I would burst out laughing. One time, I went into a grocery store and was asked who my mistress was. I was always crazy about art and made it a point to visit any art gallery I discovered. Sometimes they acted snooty or disgusted. At first, I felt uneasy and out of place, but after a while, whenever they acted disgusted, I made a point of asking the price of each piece. They would turn so red and swell up so much that it was comical. I remember hating some of those people, but at the same time, I wanted to be rich like them. Back then, I thought being rich was the solution to everything. Four blocks from where we lived, there was still another world, 84th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus. Before it was torn down, it was voted the worst block in the city. When I was a kid, I never would have imagined that people could live so bad. Living in some of those apartments was like living in a coffin. I swear, there was one building that when you walked past it in the summer, it stunk so bad, it made you want to drop to your knees. Usually I just sit on some stoop and watch the street. There was always something going on. Men standing around with do-rags on their heads, covering greasy processed hairdos, making deals, laughing and talking and looking at the women passing by. Drunks and fights and drunken fights. The streets was always alive and swarming with people. Survival and life were hanging out in the open like laundry for everyone to see. Arguments, dirty deals, misery and malice ran into the streets like pus from open sores. There was something horrible and foreboding about the street yet exciting at the same time. A little bit who went to my school, lived on 84th Street. Her nickname was Little Bit, but I called her Fruit Fly because she was crazy about fruit. I liked to hang out with her because she was a good walker. We could walk for hours without getting tired. One day, she asked me to come with her to get something from her house. When we got there, I couldn't believe it. I thought I had seen some messed up cribs before, but hers took the cake. She lived in a tiny little pea green closet of a room covered with wall to wall roaches. I just kept staring a little bit. She walked around in that horror house like it was normal. She didn't even try to kill the roaches. She just brushed them aside as if they got in her way. When I left, I itched and scratched for hours.
When I met Lil Bit's mother and I started getting to know her and some of her neighbors, I got my first lesson in hopelessness. Grab some water. Lil Bit's mother worked or used to work in factories and in laundries as a presser, but she burned her hand real bad and was on some kind of disability. She lived from day to day and from check to check. She was always sick, and sometimes her cough was so bad, I thought she was going to die any minute. She acted like she was too tired or too weak to do much of anything. They had a hot plate, but most of the time, they didn't even cook. They just ate sandwiches, usually lunch meat on white bread. Lobit's mother never went anywhere except to the clinic or to the welfare office or to the bar on Amsterdam. Sometimes she would get drunk and start crying about some man she used to go with. She didn't know anything about what was going on in the world and she didn't seem to care. 84th Street was her world and other worlds didn't really exist. When I was with Lil Bit and her mother, I felt all kinds of things, sometimes disgust and anger because they accepted anything and lived any old kind of way. Other times I felt sorry for them and still other times I relaxed and enjoyed them because they were so easy and down to earth. But whenever I hung out with them, it was down on the stoop. I would never go up in that house. Evelyn kept my excursions at a bare minimum though. She was strict and didn't play around. Every day after school, I had to be in the house by four o'clock and she would call home just to see that I had arrived safely. Evelyn didn't want me in the street too much because she said the neighborhood was bad and she didn't want me to get in any trouble. She was also, and also, she didn't want me to stay at home and do, oh wait, I read that really wrong. And she also, there we go. And she also wanted me to stay at home and do my homework. After homework, I read, I've never been too fond of television and besides even Evelyn had an excellent library. Those books were like food to me. Fiction and poetry were my favorites, although I liked history and psychology too. I also liked to read about other countries and about all the different religions in the world. The only books I never touched were Evelyn's law books. They were dry and boring and Greek to me. Evelyn was a store of knowledge and she knew about a whole range of subjects. We were always discussing or debating something hanging out with Evelyn, I started to think that I was cool and sophisticated and grown up and that I knew it all. You couldn't tell me nothing. I was just too cool. Evelyn and I went to museums and art galleries and the theater. On Broadway, off Broadway, she was turning me on to so many things. I started to view movies as an art form instead of just entertainment. I was learning what and how to order at restaurants and my vocabulary and control of the English language were expanding greatly. But life with Evelyn definitely had its ups and downs. Sometimes we got along famously and other times it was terrible. Evelyn was super honest. She just could not tolerate my lying. I would try to tell the truth and try to be honest, but sometimes, especially if I was in a tight situation, I would lie. I had been in a habit of lying, and it was easy for me to fall back into the old pattern. But it was futile to lie to Evelyn because she was a lawyer and would cross-examine me until I would inevitably trip myself up. Little by little, I got out of the habit, but it was a long and constant battle between us. Our financial situation also had its ups and downs. One week we were rich, and the next week we were poor. Evelyn was determined to be a trial lawyer and to be in pra private practice. Most of her clients were black and poor, and most of the time they didn't have money to pay her. But Evelyn would defend them anyway. She was always up in arms about some injustice or other. I used to call her the last angry black woman. But whenever somebody did pay her, we were rich. We would go out and celebrate. For a week or so, we ate steaks and lamb chops went to restaurants, took taxis. The next week, we would be right back to riding subways and eating hamburgers. Evelyn was generous and extravagant, and she had absolutely no head for business. I usually did the shopping for us since I was more tight-fisted and practical. 
once in a while. I'd be tempted to give myself a five finger discount, but Evelyn was so honest that it rubbed off on me. I was becoming so goody goody, I couldn't stand myself. I really underwent a great change. Evelyn had great plans for my future. I was going to junior high school, 44, but Evelyn wasn't satisfied with the education I was receiving. JHS 44 wasn't a bad school, but we were learning at much slower pace than, I'm sorry, than at my school in Queens. I don't remember too much about the school except for the music classes. Most of the classes, most of the class was black or Puerto Rican and we all loved music, but we hated music class with a passion. The teacher talked to us as though we were inferior savages incapable of appreciating the finer things in life. She lectured about symphonies and concertos and sonatas and like in a snooty voice. A boy would mimic the gestures and expressions of the teacher and the rest of us would giggle and snicker as she played music. The teacher became more and more exacerbated saying, listen, can't you listen? Don't you have ears? Can't you appreciate anything? I'm trying to get you to appreciate music and you all act as though you're deaf. I want you to stop talking. I want you to stop talking and listen. Do you hear me? We got louder and louder and the teacher became more and more disgusted. She would scream at us and call us names like hooligans or ignoramuses, and we returned her insults. We hated her because she thought the music she liked was so superior. She didn't recognize that we had our own music and that we loved music. For her, there was no other music except Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. To her, we were uncultured and uncouth. For her, Latin music, jazz, rhythm and blues were trashy and we were trash. She was a racist who would have denied it to the bitter end. A lot of people don't know how many ways racism can manifest itself and in many ways people fight against it. When I think of how racist, how Eurocentric our so-called education in America is, it staggers my mind. And when I think back to some of those kids who were labeled troublemakers and problem students, I realized that many of them were unsung heroes who fought to maintain some sense of dignity and self-worth. Evelyn strongly suggested that I enter Cathedral High School in the ninth grade. I was not at all happy about the idea since I hated wearing a uniform and Catholic schools had a reputation for being so strict. But Evelyn kept on strong, strongly suggesting and I got the message. I didn't mind the Catholic religious part of it, though, since I was going to mass regularly and I was kind of holy, holy that year. I took the test of cathedral and passed, and it was firm that I was going to enter cathedral the next September. I even started to feel happy about it. It was a change, and I was always, and I have always been a person who likes a change of scenery. I usually spent my weekends with one of my girlfriends or with my mother as much as possible. Tony was cool to hang out with, and she knew where all the parties were. But we never had deep conversations, so we never got really close. Bonnie and I met through Tony and began what was to be a best friend relationship with an argument about Abraham Lincoln. We argued for hours until Bonnie's aunt told us to shut up and go to bed, since neither of us knew what we were talking about. Bonnie lived in the same building my mother lived in, and after that night, we became close friends and talked about every subject on earth. Bonnie knew more than I did about what was happening in the world. And we spent hours talking about mega Evers, sit-ins, freedom rides, etc. We began to write poetry about love and black people. And sometimes we wrote morbid poetry about hate and death. As soon as we finished a poem, we called each other and read it. After a while, we read poetry together. Dorothy Parker and Edna St. Vincent Millay and were our old were our idols. <laughs> Sorry. We read everything they wrote and even memorized their poems. After that, we read all different kinds of poets. We were deep and were forever in the library or bookstore trying to find another poet who was deep too. The more we read, the more we wrote. And it came in handy in the street. And if, if we didn't like somebody or if we had some dispute with someone, we wrote a poem about them. 
We made up all kinds of dozens poems and laughed our heads off. We were young and old, happy and sad at the same time. Usually, every summer, I went down south to visit my grandparents. And when they had the business on the beach, I loved it. But they had lost two different buildings on the beach, both destroyed by hurricanes. After the last one was leveled, they operated a restaurant on Red Cross Street. I liked working in the restaurant sometimes, but it wasn't as much fun as working on the beach. One of the last summers that I spent down south, the NAACP rented a building a few doors down from my grandparents' restaurant, which was a great source of interest to me. I was forever walking by, standing in the doorway, or sliding discreetly into the building to see what was going on. I could hear them talk about integrating the South by sitting, sitting in, praying in, singing in, and about nonviolence. I was glad when, because I surely wanted segregation to end. I had grown up exposed to the degrading, dehumanizing side of segregation. I remember that when we traveled from North to South and vice versa, we really felt the sting of segregation more acutely than at other times. We drive hours without being able to stop anywhere. Sometimes we pull into a filthy old gas station, buy gas, and then be told that we were not permitted to use their filthy old bathrooms because we were black. I can remember clearly squatting in the bushes with the mosquitoes biting my bare buttocks and my grandmother handed me toilet paper because we could not find a place with a colored bathroom. Sometimes we were hungry, but there was no place to eat. Other times we were sleepy and there was no hotel or motel that would admit us. If I sit and add up all the colored toilets and drinking fountains in my life and all the back of the buses, or the Jim Crow railway cars, or the places I couldn't go, it adds up to one great ball of anger. And so, when I saw these NAACP people, I was ready to do whatever it was they were going to do, but they were very confusing. One day, I was hanging around the office and two men were talking about nonviolence and self-control. Then he walked around the room asking everybody questions. What would you do if they pushed you? Nothing. I just keep on doing what I came to do. What would you do if they kicked you? I'd pray to the Lord to forgive them for their sins. What would you do if they spit on you? I'd just go on singing. Well, that was just too much for me. <laughs> I could take someone pushing, hitting, kicking, but to sit there and let some cracker dog spit on me? Well... Just the idea of it made me want to fight. To me, if someone spit on you and it was worse than hitting you, especially if they spit in your face, I tried to tell myself that I would just sit there and take it, but every muscle in my body, every instinct I had rebelled against it. The man continued around the room asking everybody the same questions. When he came to me, I answered the same too, except for the spitting question. I don't know, I told him. What do you mean you don't know? I just don't know. Well, little sister, we can see that you're just not ready. If you want your freedom, there's no sacrifice that's too big to make. Everybody looked at me as if I was some kind of stupid idiot. I felt bad, but I still couldn't get used to the idea of letting somebody spit on me. The man said I wasn't ready and I had to agree with him. When I think back to those days, I feel such admiration and respect for the spirit of struggle and sacrifice that my people exhibited. They went up against white mobs, water hoses, vicious dogs, the Ku Klux Klan, trigger happy nightstick wielding police, armed only with their belief in justice and their desire for freedom. I remember how I felt in those days. I wanted to be an American just like any other American. I wanted a piece of America's apple pie. I believed we could get our freedom just by appealing to the consciousness of white people. I believed that the North was really interested in integration and civil rights and equal rights. I used to go around saying our country 
our president, our government. When the national anthem was played or the Pledge of Allegiance spoken, I stood at attention and felt proud. I don't know what in the hell I was feeling proud about, but I felt the juice of patriotism running through my blood. I believe that if the South could only be like the North, then everything would be all right. I believe that we Black people were really making progress and that the government, the president, the Supreme Court, and the Congress were behind us, so we couldn't go wrong. I believed that integration was really the solution to our problems. I believed that if white people could go to school with us, live next to us, work next to us, they would see that we really were good people and would stop being prejudiced against us. I believe that America was really a good country, like my teacher said in school, the greatest country on the face of the earth. I grew up believing that stuff, really believing it. And now, 20 odd years later, it seems like a bad joke. Nobody in the world, nobody in history has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were oppressing them. Once you study and really get a good understanding of the way the system in the United States works, then you see, without a doubt, that the civil rights movement never had a chance of succeeding. White people, whether they are from the North or from the South, whether it was in 1960 or 1980, benefit from the oppression of Black people. Those who believe that the president or the vice president and the Congress and the Supreme Court run this country are sadly mistaken. The almighty dollar is king. Those who have the most money control the country and through campaign contributions buy and sell presidents, congressmen, and judges, the ones who pass the laws and enforce the laws that benefit their benefactors. The rich have always used racism to maintain power, to hate someone, to discriminate against them and to attack them because of their racial characteristics is one of the most primitive, reactionary, ignorant ways of thinking that exists. A war between the races would help nobody and free nobody and should be avoided at all costs. But a one-sided race war with black people as the targets and white people shooting the guns is worse. We will be criminally negligent, however, if we do not deal with racism and racist violence, and if we do not prepare to defend ourselves against it. This is called Stranger. Everything you love is from a different world. Hungry, you turn your nose up at my peas and rice. This is chapter nine. I was taken to Roosevelt Hospital in, I do not know how to say the city's name right, Muchin, New Jersey. <laughs> I know I butchered that. And shackled to the bed by my foot. Dr. Garrett had established that I was one month pregnant. When he visited me, he demanded that the shackles be removed at once based on the elementary principle that proper treatment, both mental and physical, of a woman threatening miscarriage would not seem to include being chained to a bedpost. My mental stability was also threatened by the round-the-clock guards who sat outside my hospital room with shotguns trained at my head. After 10 days, I was discharged from the hospital over the objections of my doctor, brought to the Middlesex County Jail for Men, and kept in solitary confinement from February 1974 until May 1974. At first, they wouldn't even give me milk. Since pork was served as a staple meat almost daily, I began to slowly starve. In county jails, it goes like this. One sheet, one horse blanket, a metal cup. Your cell is raided if you have luxuries like salt. They did everything they could to thwart the care Dr. Garrett was trying to give me. They hired their own doctor and insisted that whenever my doctor saw me, their man had to be present. This meant a severe limitation on the number of visits Dr. Garrett would arrange because their doctor happened often not to make it out to the prison on the days of examination had been agreed and scheduled upon. My lawyers had initiated a lawsuit against the state 
of New Jersey in federal court charging medical maltreatment and dietary abuse. Before the date the hearing was scheduled, I was extradited to the state of New York, which made the federal court action mute. When I arrived at Rikers Island, I was anemic, malnourished, according to my interest physical. New Jersey had been giving me iron pills, but I was anemic up to the last blood test before giving birth. The pregnancy or special diet at Rikers, in addition to the regular food, was powdered milk, juice, and a hard-boiled egg daily. This was my diet until I gave birth, and things seemed to go normally. Meanwhile, the lawyers obtained another court order from the New York court permitting Dr. Garrett to continue treating me. When he first came to Rikers, I was in the infirmary. They told him the court order was no good and that he couldn't see me. I was left in a room for three days with a woman who turned out later to have active tuberculosis. It was May and they had turned the heat off. It got cold again and women who were having seizures, methadone withdrawals, and one sister who they said had pneumonia all, blan all piled blankets on their beds. The sister got worse and worse. Finally, they brought her to Elmhurst Hospital where they discovered she had, she did have tuberculosis. I found this out later when she returned to Rikers, kept in isolation and the doctors wore masks and gloves when they visit her. I also had Monila, a vaginal discharge, which worsened because the Montforce Hospital doctors assigned to Rikers could not agree about how it should be treated. They refused to treat the condition at all until my culture was returned from Elmhurst Hospital. By the time they managed to get the culture back, the whole inside of my thigh was chapped raw from the discharge and I could barely walk. Montefiore Hospital and the Health and Hospital Corporation went to court to prevent Dr. Garrett from delivering my baby. Their position was that since I was a prisoner, it was not necessary for me to have the doctor of my choice. They also said he was disruptive because when he did manage to see me, he often wrote in my chart, which they found very disturbing. The court upheld them. I was only a prisoner. I went into labor the morning of September 10th, 1974, at 4 a.m. on two main at Rikers, where I had been kept in the cycle ward. I got out of bed, took a shower, braided my hair, and packed. My labor was mild, a pinch every half hour, which rapidly became a pinch every 15 minutes. At 11 a.m., I was sure I was on my way, but I had no doctor to confirm it, and I refused to go to the infirmary. Around noon, I asked to call Dr. Garrett and they somehow got a hold of him. He was at Elmhurst Hospital trying to persuade them to let him deliver my baby. At about 3 p.m., he arrived at Rikers and I went up to the infirmary to meet him. He told me that I was, I can't believe I can't recognize this word, effaced <laughs> and definitely in labor. Damn, COVID it kicked my ass. <laughs> I would not allow the other doctors there to examine me. I was taken to Elmhurst Hospital in a motorcade. It looked to me like a million police cars buzzing around the vehicle in which I, a woman in labor, was riding. And they all followed. Into Elmhurst Hospital and up to the delivery room, they surrounded the hospital. There was a demonstration outside of Elmhurst Hospital in support of my right to choose a doctor who would deliver my baby. And Evelyn and Dr. Garrett held a press conference at the hospital to explain the situation. There were actually two policewomen inside the labor room and several outside. I was having contractions every five minutes. Finally, I let one of their doctors, a resident, examine me to see how the labor was progressing, which turned out to be a terrible mistake. When he finished, I was bleeding. After that, there was no way I would let any of them touch me again. I ordered them to bring me the, te the stethoscope to see if the baby's heart was beating normally. And I had a few other instruments I would need because I said, I am delivering the baby myself. He 
It was a standoff for a couple hours. Then a nurse told me to walk around to ease the pain and encourage labor. I got up, then pretended to fall out, knowing how afraid they were of lawsuits. And the doctor rushed over to pick me off the floor. I knew they were worried. I stated again, I am delivering the baby myself. I checked the baby's heart with its stethoscope. It was beating normally. That or the press conference or the demonstration outside the building seemed to do it. They told me that if I signed a release statement absolving them of all responsibility, they would let Dr. Garrett deliver my baby. I signed, making certain that they had no control over Dr. Garrett or over anything having to do with my labor. And that was that. He took over. He examined me listened to the baby's heart, and at some point broke my water. He explained carefully everything that would happen and answered all my questions. He gave me a local anesthetic in the cervix. I didn't want Demerol or a saddle block, but the paracervical block seemed okay. At this point, I was tired. After that, I was still in labor, but felt little pain. I went to sleep for a while. I woke up about 3 a.m. and I could feel the baby lowering and thought I could feel the baby's head. I called the nurse. She said without looking that I wasn't ready. When I insisted, she looked and went running for Dr. Garrett. They wheeled me into delivery. He gave me a local anesthetic and did the (laughs) epistemo. Yeah, I'm not gonna get to that word tonight. (laughs) Moving on, (laughs) I pushed three times and she was here. At 4 a.m., I'm gonna say this name really wrong. Uh, Kaya Amala uh, Alubala Shakur, I butchered the shit out of that, was born. I said, check that baby out just to ensure her subsequent safety. The birth itself was peaceful and beautiful out of sight. It's very important for a woman to go through the birth experience with people she trusts. Later that day, September 11th, they still hadn't brought me the baby. Dr. Garrett had gone home to sleep and when he returned at 6 p.m. that day, I still hadn't seen the baby. He reminded them that I was supposed to breastfeed her. They told him he hadn't written a prescription for breastfeeding. Finally, they brought me the baby and I breastfed her every four hours another incredibly beautiful experience. The nurses from the nursery were very friendly and kind and kept me informed about the baby's condition. But the staff in D11, the cycle ward where I was kept in a tiny guarded room were something else again. They allowed me only one shower a day, no toothbrush or toothpaste, only mouthwash. They don't furnish it, a friend can't bring it, and the prison won't allow it. I had to beg them for a bra while I was nursing. The prison refused to let me bring one. Many strange doctors tried to examine me to hasten my my discharge and get rid rid of me. I came close to physically brawling with a couple of them because I refused their examinations. Finally, they discharged me anyway, without the consent of my doctor. The commissioner of corrections, Benjamin Malcolm, I signed a paper taught taking all responsibility for my discharge. Man, I'm stuttering over this shit because as I'm reading, like a million things are going on in my head, you know, and how fucked up it is that in the year 2024, this torturous experience that she had just to bring life into the world, to have a baby, there's so many Black people who give birth who has the same story. The fuck, if we don't burn this bitch the fuck down, like this is crazy. It's just wild that it's just like, this was a treatment that people were comfortable giving her because they deemed her a prisoner, a criminal, therefore disposable. So every doctor, every nurse, and these aren't prison doctors and prison nurses, this is a hospital. We're willing to mistreat her, try to kill her baby and try to kill her and torture her up until she was in labor. The way the black women get treated at work, the way black mages get treated at work, 
is like that hostile environment. Just all this shit's going through my head. And I'm just like, God damn, when are we going to say enough is enough and really understand we are literally prisoners? This is sick. It's a sick fucking world. I hate white supremacy. I'm going to keep reading. They put me in an ambulance, chained me to a stretcher, and brought me back to the women's house of detentions at Rikers Island. It took me straight to the infirmary and said, you have to stay here and be examined. I was really depressed, having been separated so abruptly from my baby. I said, I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna be examined here. Send me to PSA, punitive segregation area, solitary confinement, anywhere, I don't care. I just have to be somewhere by myself, just leave me alone. It's not quite what they did. When I refused examination, I walked out of the infirmary and they called the goon squad, several large female officers. They all jumped on me and started beating me. They had me on the floor. Eventually my arms and legs were chained. They dragged me by the chains to PSA and stopped only when a nurse asked them to please stop. So they put me on a mattress and dragged the mattress. Man, not that I can't compare this torturous fucking dehumanizing treatment to like mages locked up behind bars now, but it's just the fact that it happened, this has been happening here in America for so fucking long, so fucking long. And we're not burning prisons to the ground. And they're just building new ones. <laughs> Man, the revolution of my lifetime. This is some sick shit. Sick shit. I'm getting pissed off reading this shit. I do it every time. It just pisses me the fuck off. This is sick. And these people went on to have kids after torturing like this woman. Had kids and those kids grew up and took positions within society to uphold the racist system and on and on and on. Man, I want to see this place burn to the fucking ground in my lifetime. I'll start reading. So they put me on a mattress and dragged the mattress. They took me to the observation room and left me, hands and feet cuffed. I had no sanitary napkins, no means to wash myself. The cuffs cut into my skin. The scars are still visible and my wrists were bleeding. Later, I found out that I had received an infraction for slapping an officer in the face while they were beating me. I still refused their medical examination. They finally brought me napkins. I was left on a mattress on the floor, no bed, no shower. I was there for two weeks. I continued to refuse all their medical attention, insisting that Dr. Garrett examined me. I refused to eat, so eventually my breasts, which were full of milk, stopped hurting. They offered doctors of all kinds and drugs, mainly tranquilizers. They sent a psychiatrist who had the nerve to ask me if I was depressed. The disciplinary board met in front of my cell and gave me an additional sentence of 14 days in PSA. All other inmates were cleared out of PSA. During this time, I was still refusing most food. I was so weak, I fainted a couple times. At that time, it was also Ramadan and when it when it is forbidden to eat until the sun, until sundown for the whole two weeks. I just ate once a day when the food was edible. And for the first few days, I ate nothing at all. God damn. Damn. After two weeks, they said, if you agree to be vaginally searched, you can go to your floor. I did and went to my floor. The next day, the captain came down to my cell and informed me that they had de decided to lock me up again for refusing a complete physical form. <laughs> God damn. For refusing a complete physical from the medical staff assigned to Rikers from Montefiore Hospital. I'm sorry, it don't matter how many times you read this, every time it's like, what the fuck is wrong with people? These crackers are fucking sick. Fucking sick. What had happened was that when I was returned to my floor, they told me that Dr. Garrett had been permitted to examine me and that he was at Rikers Island, that my lawyer had gone to court and the court had ruled 
that I could be examined by Dr. Gary. So I waited. A white doctor came in and said in order for me to see my doctor, I must see him and be examined by him first. I refused. Then they brought in a black doctor who greeted me with, hey, soul sister. <laughs> he was really sneaky. I refused him too. So Dr. Gary was forced to leave and I was put back in PSA. God damn. They threatened me with administrative segregation. So I sat on the floor and refused to move when my sentence in PSA was up. Oh, God damn, sorry, I hit my elbow. <laughs> they gave me an infraction and a verbal reprimand and said the vaginal search would be sufficient. Then the next day, they locked me up again. This time, I was locked in my cell for a month. I continued to refuse most food. They let me out to shower whenever they felt like it. I began a hunger strike at one point, and after a few days in a tiny cell, I was sick. I wondered how long I would have to hold out. Evelyn had filed a writ of habeas corpus before the Brooklyn Federal Court against Commissioner Malcolm and Essie Murphy, superintendent of the Women's House of Detention on Rikers, to force them to release me for punitive segregation. I was to appear in court for the hearing, but I didn't know the date. Then a deputy told me, your court date's been postponed and your lawyer sent her advice, see a doctor. It was a lie, but I believed it. I was examined by the prison doctors under what I thought was Evelyn's advice. So I was no longer locked, just in jail and separated from my child. This one's called Leftovers. What is left? After the bars and the gates and the degradation, what is left? After the lock-ins and the lock-outs and the lock-ups, what is left? I mean, after the chains that get entangled in the gray of one's matter, after the bars that get stuck in the heart of men and women, what is left? After the tears and disappointments, after the lonely isolation, after the cut wrist and the heavy nose, what is left? I mean, like after the commissary kisses and the get your shit off blues, after the hustler has been hustled, what is left? After the murder burgers and the goon squads and the tear gas, after the bulls and the bull pens and the bullshit, what is left? Like, after you know that God can't be trusted, after you know that the shrink is a pusher, that the word is a whip and the badge is a bullet, what is left? After you know that the dead are still walking, after you realize the silence is talking, that outside and inside are just an illusion, what is left? I mean, like, where is the sun? Where are her arms and where are her kisses? There are lip prints on my pillow. I'm searching. What is left? I mean, like, nothing is standstill and nothing is abstract. The wing of a butterfly can't take flight. The foot on my neck is part of my of a body. The song that I sing is part of an echo. What is left? I mean, like, love is specific. Is my mind a machine gun? Is my heart a hacksaw? Can I make freedom real? Yeah. What is left? I am at the top and bottom of a lower archy. I am an earth lover from way back. I am in love with losers and <laughs> laughter. I am in love with freedom and children. Love is my sword and truth is my compass. What is left? And that's the end of that one. So I hope y'all was digging that. And I don't know what I'm gonna do the next reading. It's gonna be mad random, but I always end it with Let's get free.